guys, we're doing Breaking the Family Court Chains today, and this is actually the fourth in a series of webinars that I do called Turn Your Divorce Around. But this is the last one of that series on challenging authority, overcoming status quo, and preventing undue burdens. So this is where we wrap that up. If you haven't seen the first three, don't worry about it. I'm going to give you a quick recap. And if you need the first three, send me an email afterwards at info at fixfamilycourts.com and you can send me a request asking for the previous three webinars and if I have those links I'll send those over to you if I don't I will get them so today even though Ron's not actually here I'm Sherry Palmer with Fix Family Courts and I am the author of the book that we use for the class that I mentioned that we taught to a group of parents recently and we are also strategists and constitutional scholars and we also speak on the topics so today how are we breaking barriers we're doing it through knowing how to challenge undue burdens we are breaking through these court barriers by knowing how to argue against status quo and we're learning how to challenge authority which really I've explained in prior webinars is challenging abuse of power because if they actually have the authority then you've got to use the procedure to try to prove your case and, and get get a ruling in your favor and if they have the authority to make those decisions or have that discretion then you can't necessarily go and argue what they decided if they had the authority to make that decision but what we've been dealing with in these webinars is courts and attorneys and mental health experts taking authority where they don't have it and actually just abusing their roles or their power so the way I'm going to introduce you to what I mentioned what was about what was happening with the attorneys right before we started this presentation and what's happening with the parents is called the Callum cosmological fallacy it sounds really confusing and we're not gonna you don't need to be a genius and know all the details about this but I want to show you a quick clip from this so that you can understand that this is actually a very common thing that happens and it mostly happens when you're placed under pressure or they're placed in a situation where they're under pressure like your attorneys so we're going to listen to about two three minutes of this so I'm going okay so just listen to this for a minute don't worry about not knowing the Aristotelian or Newtonian principle or anything just listen and then I'm going to explain how this relates human beings are intuitive creatures that is to say that we have pre-theoretic ideas about a variety of topics that seem to give us some sort of special immediate access to the truth these intuitions can be clear or muddled powerful or weak specific or generic their subject matter ranges from the mundane to the profound, from issues of metaphysics and epistemology to matters of ethics and science. We often group them under that oh-so-nebulous notion that we collectively refer to as common sense. They generally resist calls for rational justification. If we can replace an intuition with a well-grounded argument, we tend to prefer to do so. And that, for the most part, dissolves the need for the intuition in the first place. As it turns out, very little works the way we intuitively think that it does. Human history has been a long process of disabusing ourselves of our intuitions by smashing them against the shores of reality and seeing how they hold up. As a rule, they don't hold up very well at all. But at each step in this long process, intuition's cheerleaders have tried to stick up for it, insisting that reason, evidence, and argument, or at least our interpretations of these things, must be in the wrong. Some have championed our intuitions regarding specific topics, others as a general methodology for coming to know things, others still as the only way to have any kind of foundation for knowledge at all. Intuitions cheerleaders can be found among the most brightest luminaries in nearly all intellectual endeavors. Yet despite their eminence, history has not been kind to these cheerleaders. Let's take a short tour. Starting with the obvious, it seemed intuitively clear for a very long time that the Earth was at the center of the universe and the Sun and everything else was revolving around it. After all, it does look that way, does it not? But then again, as Ludwig Wittgenstein pointed out, what did they expect the world would look like if it were the other way around? 
It took about 100 years of tedious, painstaking scientific work between Copernicus's initial proposal of heliocentrism and Galileo establishing it as a scientific fact. And still, doubt persisted amongst much of the populace long after. Such is the inertia of intuition. Geocentrism was the astronomical view endorsed by Aristotle, the preeminent physicist of the ancient world. Aristotle proposed a detailed theory of mechanics that was amplified and expanded upon throughout the Middle Ages. It was eventually falsified and discarded due to the work of Isaac Newton, but strangely enough, those Aristotelian intuitions die hard. So hard, in fact, it seems they may actually be hardwired into our brains. A large battery of tests have shown that people's mechanical intuitions are decidedly Aristotelian. This is true even of people who have studied Newtonian mechanics. If you give them a chance to think it through, they apply the correct Newtonian principles. But if you put them in a situation where they don't have the time to think, where they can only act on intuition, they default back to the Aristotelian model. Despite 300 years of evidence, experiments, education, and applied mechanics, we can't seem to shake the ghost of Aristotle from our repertoire of intuitions. Okay. So the reason I showed that to you is simply because I wanted you to hear all of the, like he said, 300 years of going through learning something a certain way and then having someone come in and discount it, which is what happened to Aristotle with Newton, right? I'm going to get back to the screen. Okay. So the way this ties with family court issues is we all have our intuition. We all think that certain things are intuitive or work certain ways. And the law really is not intuitive. And so when parents first get involved in this, it's very confusing for them. And lawyers, when they try to use perception, bias, prejudice to make decisions and then mix it in with the law, we all know it makes a huge mess. Okay. So what they did is they defaulted to that best interest. And remember how he mentioned that, that even though certain things have been proven now, that they still continue to believe certain things with the Aristotle principles. Even the Newtonian scholars, some of them still believe certain things about it, even though it's been disproven. So that's kind of what parents are up against when you're trying to argue that parents determine best interest. Okay? So when we talk about habits through our other webinars, that's why we're so insistent on you learning certain things so that when you are presenting argument, not only is it convincing, but you are addressing those things. Okay, remember this, this is a recap, so if you need more details about those other things, let us know. We'll send you the links to those. But it all goes back to the habits. And when you're under pressure, it works the same way as this guy just explained. And he goes by Sisyphus Redeemed on YouTube. If you want to watch the rest of his video. It's really interesting. He's, but it all goes back to those habits and basically those kick in when you're under pressure. So when they put you in a spot, like let's say in mediation, and they tell you you've got to come to an agreement right away, and they want you to sign off on something, and you have not taken the time to process what your rights are, that's how they get you. Okay. Same way with attorneys when they're in court and they're presenting argument. Even if you took this to them the week before you have court, do you really think that when they're under pressure and they have certain habits and routines that they use in court that they're going to be able to do it all? No. So again, it's going to rely on you. And sometimes you have to take over in order to change what's happening. And sometimes that takes a lot of practice because, as Justin knows, you can do that and think that you're getting something and the very next hearing turn around and deal with something completely different and if you haven't done this long enough you're really not going to know what to do or how to challenge that or argue it articulately or present the right case law to tell them that you actually have the authority to make that argument especially parents they're going to look at you and say you don't have the authority to make that argument. They want to default to the other attorneys, which is why we've told you in past webinars, you have to insist on framing the case, even if you're pro se, in a manner that uses these articulate arguments with your case law. So we're going to go on to the next thing, which is this is how they continue the undue burdens. 
They get you under pressure. They get you to agree. And what do they get you to agree to? Psyche valves, home studies, counseling, gals, minors, counsel. Some states even have laws to put those in place, the gals and the minors counsel. Private interviews of your children with attorneys and judges, supervised visitation. All of these things actually can be argued as undue burdens, but not if you agree to them. I know these happen early on for a lot of people. And so they may be already in that situation and they have to try to get the pendulum to swing the other way and it is much more difficult argument, but it can still be done. But you have to know how to continue to keep that argument strong. If you argue at one time or argue it in one of your pleadings and then go to court and don't argue that in your oral presentation, you could actually lose what you gained on paper or you're actually waiving some of what you had asked for while you're in the courtroom. But if you know how not to do that, and you can actually argue these, and later in this presentation, I'm going to show you an example of how you can challenge those when they're temporary orders, when they are final orders, and what some of the cases have said. So I've pulled some case law out to show this to you, to show you that undue burdens are actually within your authority to argue and overcome. And if you set these up properly, then you can ask an appellate court to overturn these. So challenging authority and preserving error is your first order of business. When you first sit down, no matter where you're at in your case, you want to make sure that wherever you're starting from, even if you're at the end and you're dealing with a modify, modification of a permanent order, a final order, or if you're somewhere in the middle, then you want to make sure that you are presenting the choice to the judge. Now, it's not a choice necessarily that, you know, whether or not you have rights, but what I mean is you want to be presenting cases like this. Casey and you all know Troxel, Lawrence versus Texas, if you're here in Texas, and um, you want to present them because the appellate court will look at that as you gave the judge an opportunity to process that and consider that in your case. Otherwise, they may deny any appeal and say you didn't preserve error. So that's what preserve error means. It means you gave the trial court an opportunity to make a decision on that information. So what happens when you have a lawyer and they don't present it? Like that parent I told you about today that's so excited about this attorney, but the attorney says, let's wait on not presenting your constitutional rights. So that attorney is not presenting to the court or whoever she's talking to that this parent is invoking those rights. Because as you all know, you can give up most your rights. You can give up all your rights except for your 13th Amendment and I believe you can't give up your life. Um, only under certain conditions, you know, like if you have terminal illness, but 13th Amendment is slavery. You cannot agree to enter into a slavery contract. So all the other rights you can give up. So if you're not invoking them, can they not assume that you're waiving them? Absolutely. You are not preserving error. I've seen this over and over again in appellate decisions. Can you argue later that they're, you know, that you had representation, you didn't know about it. Yeah, you can try, but I haven't seen any of those as successful challenges, which is why you're still dealing with a lot of what you're dealing with today, because if the Supreme Court had overturned some of these trial courts um, in your state, you may not be having as much difficulty right now, or, their, or your state Supreme Court. So even though they've stated that you have rights, they haven't overturned divorce cases with your particular circumstances necessarily. If they have, then absolutely, if you find that, you use it and that's controlling. But most of the time they haven't, most of the time they don't touch divorce court rulings and this is the primary reason they don't. You didn't preserve error, you didn't present it. Now here's another thing. A lot of times people will bring it up later and say, hey, you know, I'm presenting it now, I didn't have to preserve it because it's a fundamental it's a fundamental right and it would be fundamental injustice if you didn't hear it now at the appellate court. Well, the appellate court also can come back and say, 
you could have asked for a new hearing based on that information of your constitutional rights. So even if the court's going to deny that request for a new hearing, that's maybe something you need to do. I hear a lot of attorneys, a lot of parents say, I didn't bother do it because they were just going to turn me down because they've turned me down 15 something times. And I know Mike's not in here right now, but he moderated for us last time. I know he's been turned down over and over and over again. And you know what? He still files them because that preserves error for him. So I know it's hard when they decline or they, you know, they turn you down, but you are preserving error. And what does that do? Eventually that's going to preserve your life because if you have any shot of overturning them at all, that's going to be the first step to that path. Oh, and I wanted to cover one more thing on there. They make you think that it's so expensive to get them overturned or to challenge it or to file appeal that they scare you into giving in. They think that you have no other choices left but to either give in or to get a bad result from the judge. They're also scared, these attorneys, to lose at the trial level. They don't understand that you're not necessarily losing if you preserved your rights. What you're, what you're experiencing is the judge may be abusing his authority, his power, and you have to challenge that. Now you have to know how to challenge it or they can get away with it. So just keep in mind that when they say everything's super, super expensive, if you are able to do this and learn it, then it doesn't have to be. Now if you have to pay someone else to do it, it might be. But you can have other people help you work on getting this research and arguments like Ron and I. We can help people do that. We just can't represent you or or um, do your pleadings for you. You would have to do that. But sometimes there are attorneys that will do unbundled services and they will make sure it's put in the right format for you. So if you bring all the work to them, then you're not going to have to pay the $10,000 that I've heard most of them out here in Texas quoting that as a starting point. In California, I've heard a lot higher. But remember, too, that appellate arguments, the main core of your rights, are the same in Texas as they are in other states. The differences are tying them to your state statutes, your their procedures and their laws, and to, to your state constitution. But none of those override your United States constitutional rights. So the U.S. stuff remains the same. So this hard stuff stays the same. Your state statutes and tying that in, that's actually much easier to do. And you're dealing with those every day in your case. So that would be easier for your attorney to figure those out. Now there's another challenge with attorneys. They are not used to challenging statutes. And that's another thing you must mention when you are going to court, any hearing, any hearing you have, throw it in anytime you can, that you are challenging the authority of the statute. And you've got to list the statutes you're challenging. You can't just say overall family laws because it's too general and it doesn't give the other side or the court an opportunity to analyze that properly with the legal analysis and to respond to you. So you can't do it at the appellate court level either. So you just you do have to spend a little time on that, but if you have to go even find a student that studies these things, find someone to help you with that that makes it more affordable for you. Take it then to an attorney they can put it together. You may have a challenge finding one to do it because, like I said, they're scared to do things that they think you might lose at the trial court level. We keep trying to tell them that's not the end of the world anymore if you do it right. They're used to not presenting your rights and giving the judge the authority to waive your rights and make these decisions for you, which is why they're scared. They think that's all that they can do and they know that's not going to be overturned at the appellate court level unless there's a due process error or something obvious. So overcoming status quo then means that you do have ways to argue that and one of them is undue burden. So if they are telling you to maintain the lifestyle of the marriage or to continue choices that you made in the marriage, like maybe one of the parents were told that they get to stay home while you work or vice versa, asking you or forcing you to maintain that type of, of lifestyle, you can argue, is actually an invasion of your privacy 
and an undue burden because you have a right to a divorce therefore you have a right to make different decisions in your life and so many people can't make the decisions they want to make in life now because they have been overburdened with all kinds of expenses and charges and they call it responsibility but they're treating you different than they treated you when you were in marriage you had that responsibility in marriage as well and yet they didn't impose the same standards that they are now so you would argue the second class stuff that we have in our book so as you see I lost my status quo uh, lecture that I had done and I, I'm intending to recreate it but this is a little bit about what I talk about in it so if you have additional questions on status quo let me know I'll give you some more information on this because this is a biggie then this goes right back to what we talked about with the intuition. They fall back into believing that it's best for a child to not have changes in their life or that it's best for you to maintain the lifestyle of the other parent and then they they are convinced it's best for society as well. So instead of arguing whether or not it's best for your child which opens up their desire to bring in mental health experts and so you know social science experts and different people and then you start searching psychology magazines to try to to um, support your argument take it a different route don't argue with them about whether or not that's best or not you argue that there's some harms that they might perceive now this is not a danger to the child type of harm or harm to the level of child abuse there's some harms in life that the court is not allowed to protect someone from suffering one is being divorced divorce is harm yet they can't stop you because the Supreme Court says you actually do have a right to divorce so moving your child even when you're in marriage is harm the ch children very seldomly like it a lot of times teenagers will fight against it but again, it's not the kind of harm that the court is really allowed to protect that child from. Also, being poorer when you get divorced is not the kind of harm they can protect from. Now, they'll quote, you know, poverty, that certain people go into poverty, and that's why they're, they have an interest to prevent those things from happening. Now, if they narrowly tailor something, um, they might be able to do something for a very short period of time to help the other person get on their feet because now you've got a challenge of are, is what you are asking, is your right now imposing a bigger burden on society and, and it can impose a burden on society but is it of the burden that the state has a right to prevent for a short time? In other words, sometimes they have short-term alimony or you know maybe you have to pay a little bit of child support because um, you don't you travel a lot and you're not actually supporting the child to the minimum standards now that should be a standard that everyone's held to not just you and it shouldn't be based on your income according to what we've discovered with constitutional stuff so so there's there's some a little bit of gray area but it's not as huge as what they as what they make you think it is to take a percentage of your income and do all these things actually we believe from what we've researched is outside the scope of their authority so you just have to know how to present that and they may disagree with you but when they disagree if you have invoked authority and I'll show you how to show that then it doesn't matter as much because the appellate court then will review it under error of law and they'll do their legal analysis to see if that's actually the way it's been applied before whether there's controlling argument you know controlling case law which you're using from either your state Supreme Court and hopefully the US Supreme Court hopefully both then they'll evaluate it using their tests and they those tests are in a lot of the opinions in your appellate court so you can read through those and they'll tell you exactly what they look at so did you also know that to argue status quo and overcome it you can argue that they're treating you like second-class citizen because you were allowed to make those choices without their permission before your divorce but again if you just say it the way I just put it here they're gonna deny it because you didn't use an authority there's case law that I get these things from and then I just generalize 
Okay. So what do you need to be effective with this? Because of course I've told you, okay, great, so you need to learn these things. Well, that's hard to do on your own. It takes a lot of time. And what's happening to you right now? Right now, you may not have a lot of control over the events in your life. When you go through divorce, the first thing it does is throw your whole world into a spin and where you may not even be where you're comfortable, you may not be in your own home, you may not be living the day-to-day -day routine that you were used to, and in fact, they could throw hearings in your lap within hours sometimes, and you have to run to the courthouse, you have to prepare, sometimes you have to find an attorney, so, so as, as you can see, a lot of these events are out of your control. So it makes it very hard for you to focus on learning something else, or being effective because here's the other problem you don't have time to come up with strategy right so you have to get control over the event somehow some way even if it's chaotic in order for you to come up with strategy we go through that in different forums but when you do get the proper strategy in place and you do get a handle on your events going on in your life you will have more confidence what we do is we help you go through and identify which events you don't have control over and be prepared for them when they hit because they're gonna hit most people so you might as well prepare like they called emergency hearings in my case and I if I had known that that could even happen I would have not felt as shocked as when they came across my desk so when you start learning about what could possibly happen amazingly you will be more prepared because it won't be the same shock and when your system goes into a shock remember what we went over with intuition it's going to kick into that pressure cycle where you can't make those decisions that are based on this new information you're going to default back to oh gosh I gotta prove that I'm telling the truth or oh gosh I gotta prove I'm a good parent and that puts you right back into that dead-end trap path that they siphon everyone down and right back into that expensive siphon where they're going to ask you for more money to try to prove what you're saying and that's what you want to avoid so these are the three things that you need to be effective and there is a way to get control of your life even though they've thrown it into that tailspin and I want to go over with you real quick some poll results I know some of you may not have seen them but I ran some polls on uh, our website I posted on Facebook and one was did your temporary orders change the status quo 71 percent said yes so if they're claiming to maintain status quo then why did they change it seems like arbitrarial arbitrarily and capriciously seems like a lot of times it's whoever filed first so don't buy their their lies to you that they are maintaining status quo what they're doing is creating their own environment and creating their own pattern and they're maintaining that so you can argue that they didn't maintain status quo they changed it now you don't want to argue to go back to a status quo but I just want to show you how often it happens so that you know it's not just happening to you and that there are arguments to overcome it because they actually set a new status quo did your temporary orders make you a visitor in your child's life 71 percent yes so again, they are not treating you the way you were treated before you went through the divorce. So there's your second class citizen argument. And they took your rights away before proving you unfit or a clear and present danger properly. So you have arguments there. Did your attorney go to talk to the judge without you present? I know in Connecticut they do this regularly where they'll go and decide a temporary order and they won't let the parents in. That is wholly, I would consider it in violation of your due process unless you authorize it. Now you, you get an attorney and they go in there and, and they speak for you so they see that as you're authorizing it. So you have to put down on the motion that you file even if they force an attorney to do it this way that you are not authorizing it. You are objecting to it. They might still force you but you have objection on the record. What is that called? You preserved error. Now let me explain something about due process violations. So I'm going to show you a case here in a few minutes where they can violate your due process sometimes all throughout this thing. And there's two different ways 
to try to deal with it. One is they call mandamus, and the other one is an appeal once you get a final order. And a lot of times you end up having to wait until the appeal, the final order appeal, because a lot of times the appellate court will say that you have remedy. And you may think, I don't have remedy. I told the court they violated my due process. I filed complaints. I did this the complaint to the board. I filed complaints to the court. I filed objections. They ignore me. They deny it. Even some strike it from the record. You keep track of that. As painful as this is, and as long as you may think that it takes, it's actually faster to keep track of that, keep pushing forward. If they're going to deny you a bunch of stuff, push for that final. Don't wait for the new status quo to keep settling in or to try to switch things over or to, or to try to get benefit in ways that most of these attorneys tell you to do it because you're losing time. And if it's clear that the court's going to violate your rights, then... I don't know why you think they're going to change or keep messing with them because that's just going to cost you money. You have to get really strong and just say, that's it. I'm done with it. I'm not going to keep believing what if or I might. If you catch yourself saying what if or I might, your brain is in the wrong path and you need to reset it. And that's when you go back and remind yourself, I have these rights. I've got to stand by these rights. They treated blacks like this. They treated women like this. They treated many minorities like this where they say it's okay to treat me like this, a divorced parent or one going through modification, it is no different than when they treated blacks, minorities, and women like this, where they said it's okay to treat you differently. It's okay that you can't vote. Well, we know that all got overturned, but it didn't get overturned by not fighting. And many of those people, if you recall, they did not have attorneys representing them. They had to go speak for themselves. Alice Paul went and spoke to lawmakers herself. The blacks stood up for themselves. You know, yes, Rosa Park had an attorney to go to court because they arrested her. So I'm not saying they never ever had attorneys, but I'm saying the majority of the work they had to do themselves. So if everyone keeps trying to avoid doing this work, then you're going to keep getting the bad results. I'm going to go through this one kind of quickly so we can get to some of the other stuff. But part of getting control of your events is using what's called a try equation and I get this from the book called the 10 natural laws of successful time and life management this this will be on this slide at the bottom it's by Hiram Smith I've introduced it in prior webinars and it, I know it sounds weird because it's about strategies for increased productivity and inner peace but when you apply some of these best practices to what you're going through in your court cases you'll actually be more effective because these are principles that cross industries. These are not principles that are only applicable to business. And by the way, law is business. Your life is a form of business. So they cross apply. Okay, so in order to get control back over your events that we mentioned earlier, when you're getting frustrated, stressed, anger, and fear sets in, it leads to tremendous pain. So I created this acronym for pain and that was to increase your productivity you have to have adaptation principles which will bring in inner peace and give you negotiation leverage and that will give you your power and your authority back so I created that that pain acronym did not come from the book I kind of synthesized some of the information from the book and applied it to family courts and what you're dealing with so how do you avoid pain you don't avoid it by not confronting the attorney's thinking or the judge you take control over the events by saying I have an effective strategy now and I'm going to stick to it and no matter what they throw at you you don't veer off that you stick with it it's when they get you to give in a little bit that they get you off of that which takes that leverage away from you okay so if you start saying alright fine you don't have to follow that Supreme Court ruling okay fine I understand I worked and I wasn't exercising all my time with my child so you can go ahead and have it because I wasn't using it anyways okay that's how they get you off track that's how they start telling you what to do or if you say okay fine I'll do the psyche valve because I have nothing to hide well what why are they doing the psyche valve if they don't have any charges against you it's okay if you even have a mental illness as long as you're not a danger to the child directly, right? They're doing it to fish 
for something, to find something wrong with you so they can choose which parent they feel is better based on their bias and their prejudice or whatever bullet point list they want to say that they use to make that decision. That's not what they should be doing. Yes, states get to decide how they want to incorporate dissolving your divorce contract, but what they don't get to decide is whether or not you have those rights unless you let them. So being in control gives you the ability to manage your time and events because when you tell them you're not going to give in to something, then guess what? They can't impose those psych evals and all these other things. Now you have more time. Now you don't have to run around and find how to get the money to pay for it or reset your schedule every week because maybe they ordered counseling, those types of things. You argue those. You take it a higher level if they tell you you're denied on it. So don't let them force you. This will give you confidence once you see that when you challenge them properly, they're going to start, one, they'll start either caving, which happens in a lot of the parents that I help with their attorneys or if they're doing it on their own, a lot of times the other side starts caving because the other side is also conditioned to parents giving in. Now, if you've been doing it for a long time and they know that if they just increase the pressure, you'll cave again, you may have a lot more pressure you have to tolerate or put up with before they start to give in. And some, and in some cases, they'll never give it. Then it's super important that you preserved error so you can overturn things. And there's your resource. Looks like I didn't finish typing that, sorry. This is the 10 Natural Laws of Successful Time and Life Management. Excellent book, lots of great things in it. So effectiveness, we like to call preventive law. How does a parent obtain the ammunition to be effective and to get control over your events? You use the case law. You persuade the other side that the court, now this is if you're in negotiations before you go to court, and this is what we teach to the attorneys. We tell them, don't just go into it and say, well, yeah, my parents on supervised visits, and so if you're agreeing that you're going to consider them not having supervised visits if they give the other parent sole custody, then they get standard visitation or whatever. Use this case law instead of giving in to that. Persuade the other side before it ever even goes to that court. You may have court scheduled, but tell them, look, I believe the court's going to apply this opinion, and I believe it's going to be favorable to me. Now, that's actually a quote here that came out of um, Case Analysis and Fundamentals of Legal Writing, 1995. It's a book that I use quite often. It's an old book that Ron had learned out of to write briefs when he was in college. But again, it's by William Statsky and R. John Wernett Jr. It's kind of a tough book to read and to put the analysis into what you're doing. But if, if you're you know, a real intellectual brain and you want to read something like that, that's, that's a good book. But it's hard to apply it, so you may need some help from an expert like Ron uh, to help you figure out how to tie these things in. But it, Let's go back to the slide. In most parents' cases, it's the court, not the trial court. Okay? And what I mean by that is you're banking on the appellate court agreeing with you. You're not telling the other side this, but you can actually tell them if you want to, but I would say you have to tell them immediately. But when you're negotiating or your attorney's negotiating and if the other side still strong arms you, then tell them eventually. Say, hey, you know what? It doesn't matter if, or if the trial court decides against me. I believe the appellate court's going to be favorable. Then you're letting them know you no longer have that fear. Now they've got to rethink, or it's going to cost them even more. Because I can guarantee you they'll go back to that other parent and say, you're going to pay ten, twenty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 if you need to appeal this, so maybe you need to start reconsidering. or you know, Get them to put pressure on the other side. And that's how sometimes you can get that other attorney to apply pressure to the other parent. The risk that you run, though, when you start taking this approach is that the other side might start inflaming and making more claims about you, more allegations. And I know some of you are already dealing with those, so you really don't have a lot to lose by pushing the issue. But also, if you're afraid of that, then you try even harder to get them to settle out of court but you may just 
have to face that. And that means that you're going to need to be prepared to preserve error and plead with the court that they are not filing proper charges. Do not let that be heard in family court. And if it does, you keep objecting on the record so that you can challenge that in the appellate court. They didn't use the proper due process. Because if they're going to deprive you of a fundamental right and they don't make the proper charges and they call it quasi-criminal, then you weren't able to put on a proper defense. So there's lots of argument you can make around that. And if they're going to keep insisting on that, you're better off pushing that through and getting that final order. Otherwise, they're going to keep dragging you along. And I, I know that's happening with a couple of you right now. They'll just try to keep it in the family court and keep dragging you along until more time and more time passes where you're not with your child. Then, the, then you've got this new status quo to overcome and just all kinds of other things they'll pile on top of you. That's why I say get these resolved as quickly as possible. Go down to the third bullet point to be effective in taking such a position in your negotiation process. You must be able to convince the other side of you, the perceptiveness in your findings, your readings, your applying opinions. Our book helps a lot with that. We've had several parents now actually purchase the book for their lawyer. And when we sit and go over some of the argument with the lawyers, we point them to pages in our book so they can look to see how the case law ties in. And they've actually gone and looked through the book and told me that they're using that. So, but again, they all want to wait until they appeal a lot, a lot of them anyways. So don't let them do that. It's up to you. You guys are the ones hiring them. You have to get them to do it. And if they're not going to do it, make sure you're not paying the wrong attorney. So when an attorney advises clients that they're going to not use your rights, and this is kind of what I mean by the fourth bullet point, that in business, they'll always tell you to look at legalities of the transaction, right? Look at your rights, look at the contractual agreements. But for some reason, family law, they don't do that because they want to default to arbitrary and capricious standards, best interest. They want the judge to decide if the two of you don't agree. They want you to waive your rights. Don't do that. You wouldn't do that as a business client. Why are you doing that as a parent? So what does studying and knowing case law do for you? Well, it helps you negotiate your case before you head to court to litigate. It helps you understand the Constitution, statutes, ordinance, and administrative regulations. It helps you give leverage, which will give you power. And it helps you protect from abuse of power. As we said, once you preserve it, you can go to the appellate court, ask them to overturn it. It protects you from having to spend tons of money doing invasive and burdensome things. So even if they go ahead and they order something and you've objected to it, now you file, you can do several things. You can try to file uh, an injunctive relief with your appellate court if you have rules that allow for that. You've got to check your rules on these different things. You can ask the court to reconsider and do another hearing on your constitutional rights and argue that that's why you think that it's invasive or an undue burden and that you think the statute is exceeding your constitutional rights. So ask them if you can argue that and when they don't let you, ask the appellate court if that's something that you can put like a temporary restraining order on from being enforced. Those types of things. Understanding case law also protects you from having to beg for your rights back later. Gives you grounds to overturn them if they didn't meet the proper threshold to take these rights from you. Will you always be successful? No, certainly not. So is it a risk? Yes, but it's also a risk giving in. Then you basically gave up what maybe they were already going to take anyways. So why not make them fight for it harder to take it from you? What I see happening right now is so many parents are making it easy on them. And you're making it harder on yourself because you're paying all these excessive uh, funds to go out to psyche valves and studies to try to prove your case. Instead of just fighting them this way, which is cheaper, if you're going to get those bad results anyways, make them fight for it. So it's a lot like giving up your liberty if you don't fight for these things. It would be like saying it's okay if you don't have a right to vote. That's why I put this picture on here. It's, it, this Martin Luther King says, I don't possess myself. I can't live as a democratic citizen observing the laws if I can't vote. If I just have to submit to the edict of others, that is what they've resorted to. That's what they have put you into as a parent.
And when you realize that, you're no longer okay with giving in to them. You're no longer okay hiring an attorney that says, let's just wait on your rights. You don't have anything else but your rights. That is your liberty to life. So if an attorney says that, I don't know why you would pay an attorney who's admitting to you on the face then that they are not going to protect you, that they're going to put you through an expensive battle. So any society that will give up a little liberty to gain a little security will deserve neither and lose both, and that's Benjamin Franklin. So these are very wise people. They knew this a long time ago. And when it's happening to you, I know it's difficult. It's You may think it's easy for me to sit here and say stand up to them. Nobody ever thinks it's easy. But anything in life that's worth anything didn't come easy necessarily. You just have to decide for yourself. So when you're trying to break through these barriers, you may be suffering from what we call the elephant principle. And that is, if you're not familiar with it, you may have been conditioned to believe they take over your rights to your child when you go through divorce. Let me explain to you real quick. The elephant principle is elephants, when they're babies, they're tied with a chain to a little stake. And when they're babies, they pull on it and they can't free themselves. So when they get older and they could actually break the chain, the reason you don't see them running around and doing that at circuses is because they no longer believe they can break that chain. They've been conditioned to believe they aren't strong enough. So they actually don't know their own strength. That's happened to parents over and over again for so long that we've all been conditioned to believe that when you go to, first you believe that you just go to an attorney and you just dump money in their lap and tell them to prove you're the better parent to help you. You think that's the way it's done. So you've been conditioned to believe that if you fight back, you're not acting in the best interest of the child. A judge will tell you that themselves. They're trained that in their judge's manuals. You have to fight back on that as well. You have to be aware of that perception and let them know that you're on to that. That that excuse that they use is no longer going to work. So if you're not comfortable calling things lies, I know Ron likes to call things court lies. A lot of times I call them excuses. They use excuses to take over your rights to get you to give in. It's kind of like a, a police officer coming to your house or pulling you over in your car and saying, roll down your window, I want to search your car. And if you tell them no, they can't do it without a warrant or unless they have proper probable cause. If you tell them yes, they can do it regardless. Same thing with family courts. You're telling them yes. You've been conditioned to believe that if you don't pay child support, you aren't caring for your child. How many times, how many of you have faced a hearing for enforcement and they said, why don't you want to pay for your child? And how many of you walked in there with case law that says, according to the Supreme Court or this or my state constitution, I have a right to care for my child directly, myself. It doesn't say, if I did it before. Now, you, yes, you have to have a relationship with your child, but it doesn't say if the other parent did it during the marriage most of the time and you didn't. It, no, it doesn't say any of that. So you argue with them, and when they, if they deny your argument, you appeal it immediately. You can appeal those enforcement orders. You have been conditioned to believe that you have to keep life the same for your child. So when they're talking to you about things, saying, oh my gosh, how awful for you to move them from their childhood schools and all these things, or how awful of you to want them to go back and forth between two homes, again, case law says you don't have to keep your life the same for your child. It's your right to make those decisions. You've been conditioned to believe that you have to prove you're better than the other parent to keep your rights, your money, and your child. Not true. Those are excuses for them to dip into your pocketbook. You've been conditioned to believe that the judge, mental health experts, and attorneys grant your rights to you for your child when they approve of your decisions. Or they get to tell you what decisions to make. If you're not unfit or clear and present danger and you don't waive those rights, you don't give in. Not true. You've been led to believe that judge and attorneys get to spend your money without your permission and without proving the authority to do so within the context of the Constitution. So again, they may say we have a statute here that says that we're allowed to do it. Well, then you say I'm, I want to go on record to say that I'm challenging the statute as being unconstitutional. 
can you make that argument? You've been led to believe that statutes meet the requirements to be legal. Again, you need to argue on the record that you're challenging the authority of the statute. You've been led to believe that appeals take longer and are more expensive. I know lots of people have been going through this for four years, five years, six years. Mine took seven before it was totally resolved. I don't know of many appeals that took that long. It may take a year or two to go through appeal, a lot shorter time than what I'm hearing, and a lot less expensive than $200,000. I hear a lot of parents lately that have spent $100,000 and $200,000. I don't hear many of them that spent that on appeal. So if you're frustrated and you're being treated like you're a second class, class citizen, you're losing time with your child, you're spending tons of money but getting nowhere, and you're in a holding pattern, you need to break out of it. You can start here today, and let me see if this link will work. Um, we made a new, well, we still have our book page on Fixed Family Cords, but I wanted to show you Ron worked real hard on making this landing page for our book, and so it explains a little more to you about how it preserves your parental rights. So you can look at this on your own time, but I just wanted to show you a couple of things. Um, you know, there's a warning in here that if you don't use this, you're losing your rights. You're waiving your rights. So anyways, you can read this on your own time. Here's the table of contents of the book if you don't already have it. And we have a money back guarantee on the book as well. So if you're not happy with the book, and within the first four weeks, then you can get a 100% refund purchase price of your book. Let's go to the next slide. The book provides you with message simplification. So if you don't have time to do all the research on your own, it's about $34.95 from our website. And I think on Amazon, it goes back and forth between like $31 something and $32. They do different discounts on their own. You can get that book. It can simplify the messages for you teaches you how to stop giving them permission to treat you and your child like a second-class citizen. It teaches you how to say what you want done about your rights. It teaches you how to articulate solutions to the judges and attorneys. And if you weren't in the last webinar, we have a page called Parent and Child Rights Made Simple. I would recommend all of you give a copy of that to an attorney if you're using one. Print it off. Keep it with your, your file because it references concepts that you need to grasp and that is how to explain to the court that the children shouldn't be getting treated as second-class citizens either and when they're depriving them of one parent or the other that's what they've done is, is they've said that it's okay to treat them different than they got treated in marriage when they had a right to both of you as much time as they wanted as much time as either both, either of you individually decided. Okay, but if the book isn't enough, then we have a Parental Rights Academy. In course one, we've changed the name up a little bit. We presented these in a, a previous webinar a couple of, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, and the classes were actually starting with course one. We were going to start with course two, but we are starting with course one on July 16th, and the first one is a 12-week course online. And it's how to protect your child by protecting your rights. It is part one of a two-part course. And the second part is how to protect your child by asserting your rights. And that's where you create the roadmap. That's the course that we taught many of the parents that are in this webinar today. That's an eight-week course online. That's where you learn how to apply your rights and to overcome abuse of power. Both of them you're learning to overcome abuse of power. Both of them you are learning to apply. But the second one, you're actually creating a roadmap where we use mind mapping and learning what your resources are and things like that where we don't do that in the first one. So there's extra stuff that we do in course two and in course one we analyze case law, in course two we do not. We actually apply. So then in course three, that's where we use our other book which is the Protecting Parent-Child Bonds. And that's that's how to solve the family law problem and make family law codes constitutional. That's the, an eight-week course as well, so it's a total of 28 weeks. And that's where you're going to learn how to, I don't know why I put stand, but that's where you're going to learn how to, I think I meant to say, make a stand and change the direction of public policies and power holders' perspectives on the constitutionality of the family codes. 
So a lot of power holders, lawmakers, and others will tell you that they believe the family codes are constitutional. So you need a way to articulate that they're not and why, and that's what the Protecting Parent Child Bonds does for you. But again, if you're not able to figure out how to actually articulate it once you read the book, then we have a course where we'll actually lecture on how you would present these things and tie them in and have that articulate argument. So that's three, <clears throat> three courses. Two of them are part one and part two, and the third one stands on its own. But if you don't know your rights, you might have a, quite a bit of trouble with talking to lawmakers because you're going to fall back into those old patterns and it, they'll be able to drag you around. So learning your rights is how you protect them. So this is the first course and some more about what you learn if you take it. It's like 12 weeks of intensive going over what your rights are in detail. Again, we're not attorneys. This is strictly from constitutional viewpoint and what we've learned through doing our research. But this will teach you how to know when your attorney is protecting your rights or placating you. And this will teach you how to know when the judge is abusing his authority and harming your child and how to argue against it. So you'll recognize when either one of them, the judge or the attorney, is giving your child away and how to challenge it. You will know when the attorneys and judges are going outside the legal process to deprive you and your child and how to set the boundaries. Preserve error is another word for setting boundaries. Keeping This will keep you from getting snowed by people who just want to make money from you, your suffering. I know a lot of you walk into that a lot, especially with mental health experts and counselors, they get on these court lists and the courts just seem like they automatically assign you to it and assign you to mediation. And then if you do end up in those situations, how do you make it more productive? So even if you're challenging it at the same time, but you may be getting ordered to go to mediation, let's say, you'll know how to use it more effectively by taking the class and knowing your rights. You'll know how to make decisions that don't forfeit or waive your rights unknowingly, and you'll do it confidently. You'll know what to do and when. That's important so that that intuition that might be counterintuitive to what you really need to do because kind of goes back to what's the most popular thing that gets talked about that's counterintuitive that the counselors used to do. It was parental alienation. It's how they used to think, give the child space and then let them make the decision on whether they want to go back to that parent that's being alienated. We now know that's not correct. We know parental alienation is counterintuitive. So is law. So you need to learn it. You'll have a community of people there for you online and you'll be connected with the other local people on our private Facebook pages so you can communicate the course material and challenges that you may be having throughout trying to implement this material and learning it. And if we have someone in your area, we will make sure they know, if you let us know in enough advance, when a hearing's coming up, we'll ask them if they can't go and attend and observe. And they can help remind you of some of these things and help keep you confident about some of the material that you learned because you all took the class. So you can serve as a support group for each other. So you not only get this class, but you also get the other two courses that I mentioned to you for the price of 1200 so we break this down in monthly payments and if you're taking the whole 20, 28 weeks, we can break it down over those 28 weeks. So you can see it would be very inexpensive for you to pay that over extended period of time and a lot less money than dumping five, ten, twenty thousand dollars to an attorney and not knowing how to be effective. And the amount of time that it took us to do this, I calculated between me and Ron, it would have cost us seven thousand two hundred dollars to teach somebody one-on-one -on -one this course material. So by putting it in a group environment we can teach all of you and make it cheaper for you to learn it. Because I know a lot of people come to us and they want to hire one-on-one -on -one, and we're trying to make it in group settings and more and easier for you so that you're not having to foot so much bill to learn it. Now I know it's still cheaper to learn from us one-on-one -on -one than to just go to an attorney and not have this information. But again, we're always striving to make this less and less expensive for people as we're able to do that. So many parents have told us that if they just knew this information before they gave their attorney $20,000 or before they signed that agreement, 
that they might have been better off. They would have used this information and they would have wanted to preserve their rights. An average attorney might cost anywhere from $1,200 to $2,000 for just six hours. You're getting 12 weeks worth of instruction with this class. That's a lot of value for a little bit of money. Some parents have spent upwards of $100,000 to $200,000, as you guys know, and attorneys don't teach you this material. They depend on you not knowing this. So our delivery model is going to allow us to bring it to you for $1,200. It's going to empower you, give you leverage, confidence, and hope, and this class leaves you with information transfer that you get to carry with you and keep forever, pass on to the generations, and learn how to preserve your issues for appeal. And when you just go with an attorney and you pay them money, what are you left with? Many times they haven't even gone to a hearing and you've paid 20000 They didn't even get a final order. So this is going to help you know when to walk away from those things as well. So take back your parental rights today. You take back control of your life. In addition to this course, and included in this $1,200 price for the next 48 hours, if you decide you want this, this discount, you've got to let us know in 48 hours. So by the, let's see, by the end of Tuesday, by midnight, you will also get, oh, before we go into that, you, know, you already know you get the three classes, but I wanted to show you a sample of some of what you'll get in taking this class. And here's some case law why appeals are required when in final order and why you can request injunctive relief when you're in temporary order. And here's a case that I pulled and I want to show you how much you can get from just one case. Okay, I'm going to show you a sample from this one case that applies to all three of these courses. Paez Basto versus Beers, District Court, Florida, 2014. Brand new case. If you look through this, you'll see why it says that you can file for injunctive relief and it explains to you what the requirements are for injunctive relief, right? And they're saying why they use it and here's where I got the information that you know says if if you still have an appeal that's available to you how they might think that you know you still have remedy so they might not hear it. This person filed with the federal court Okay, instead of the state court and that's why they're doing this kind of review they're saying hey there's still avenues for subsequent review and correction of the allegedly incorrect decision alright so they're using a process they have four things that they look at when you file for injunctive relief before they'll go ahead and say okay I'll, I'll take your case and look at it they look at those four things that I'll show you in a few minutes and one of them was, would they prevail on this review? And they're saying they wouldn't because their violation that they claim, procedural due process, they're saying still has a remedy of the appellate court in the state court. Until, until they run that out, they don't want it. They're not going to hear it because they feel that they still have sufficient remedy. So that's just one thing that you'll look at in the first class. You'll learn how to look at these cases and pull that stuff out and find the things that give you leverage for your case. So here's our second course, how to protect your child by asserting your rights. This is where parents that took this course created their roadmap so they could see strategies that are available and know what resources they have. So they know, you know, if I don't have $20,000, what other path that they can use they may know that they have to go and pull more of their own rights and present them on the record and know how to argue with the judge themselves. So they'll work on that and practice that as opposed to training an attorney that maybe they'll run out of money and won't be able to pay for. Um, so that this class teaches you about that and how to identify what your resources are, how you can maybe leverage your resources a little better, like especially your cash that you have on hand. You need to leverage that because almost everybody I know eventually is going to run out even if they have a lot of money to start with. They will get drained. If the attorneys know that you have that, they're going to try to layer everything they can because they're going to look at that too as, okay, we have resources so we can fight the whole fight. And so they're going to use your resources. You need to take control over that. So you need to know how to frame your argument, either yourself or to your attorney, and how to argue more effectively. 
without asking for things that are opening the door for them to want to bring in those extra burdens and expenses. So every parent that took this class said they immediately felt more help, hopeful and empowered. An average attorney would cost $6,000 for the same number of hours that it took us to put this course together for you. This is an eight-week course. You get eight weeks of instruction on this. And last time uh, we went through the course, I actually took some time out and did some one-on-ones with the students so that you could get some individual time and, and I could help you work through the material if you were having trouble. That's not always guaranteed, but if I have time, sometimes I'll pull some students aside from some of the classes and do that with them because I want you to get as much as possible out of this because again this is a legacy this is something that you're gonna carry down to your children your children are gonna carry down and this is what's gonna protect them from the same thing happening to them this is what's gonna stop the family courts from these abuses in addition to these two courses you'll get the third one but let's go over a sample of what you might use from case law with this course And this is just some more numbers and what it empowers you, gives you leverage and hope. So here's the same case, Paez Basso versus Beers. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but this is about substantive components of the due process clause. Now in this one, you would be looking, this class, you would be looking at how you would actually apply the, what the case says to your individual situations. So you would want to know what they consider the components of the due process, right? So if you're claiming your due process is violated, and in the first course you learned that it's violated, and I showed you that part of the case. So in this part of the course, now you want to know, well, how do I actually use this in my case to show that it's violated? And that's where you find here where it says fundamental rights are incorporated against the against the states, your Bill of Rights are fundamental, and a finding that a right merits substantive due process protection means the right is protected against certain government actions, regardless of the fairness of the procedures used to implement them, right? So you would argue that at your trial court level, if you're still at that level, and let them know that, look, if you violate my fundamental rights, because these are enumerated in my Bill of Rights, and not all of the rights have to be enumerated, as this case says, then you're going to be overturned. So you've got to convince them that you believe the appellate court's going to side with you because you are arguing this in a more articulate and convincing manner than any parent before you ever has. And you can see you've got your Planned Parenthood versus Casey and everything else. So this is the class where you would do that part. And here's the third class, how to solve the family law problem, make family laws constitutional. Eight-week eight course again, and this one, is so it's a, a $4,800 value. It's included in your $1,200 package. This course empowers you to know how to tell anyone in power what constitutional laws should look like. How to argue when a statute is unconstitutional and provide a solution. You can prove it to them after you take this course. And it, an average attorney would cost you probably about $6,000 for the same number of hours. But remember, most of the attorneys do not know this. Just this week, I talked to a constitutional attorney, and you know. They, unfortunately, they weren't family law. They've done family law appeals, but they didn't even have the right language down. They didn't have the right understanding of how you talk about this. It's important that you can speak up about this, that you can argue this, that you can convince people of this. Because if you hire an attorney to learn it and they don't know how to argue this themselves, then you're not learning it and you're going to end up in the same rut, right? the same traps, the same pitfalls, it's all going to lead right back to that. You are going to have to steer them out of that. You have to be the lead person in it. So this class leaves you with the information transfer that you need to be able to do that. Not just to pass down to your kids, but it gives you that final finishing touch on the other two classes so that if you end up at that appellate level, you're also probably going to be fighting the statutes and you need to convince your lawmakers to update those as soon as possible so that other parents don't have to go through this fight because the judges are operating this way because they feel that they're authorized. The statutes are authorizing them and that's why they get confused when you try to argue and, and challenge them. 
So you have to know how to convince them that you understand that you do have the authority to argue and challenge them. Okay, so all three of these courses combined is a total value of $16,800. This delivery model allows us to offer it to you for $1,200. You will also get both the books, and when we create a workbook for the second class, we'll be sending that out to everyone as well. So the cost of the workshop is not going to be charged to you anything extra because there is a we're we're gonna do a special special session with the parents that took the courses where others are not invited into that part of the workshop and then we will have a segment of the workshop where it's free for other people to come but they won't have all of this training so they're not going to get the same value from it that you're going to get they'll get some value believe me because a lot of them are not being introduced to this or told but you're going to get a tremendous amount more value and you're going to get some of your questions answered and you're going to be given priority when it comes to you know your inquisitions and things that you need at that workshop so you don't pay anything extra for it at all and then if you enroll within the next 48 hours you get the $1200 price otherwise each of these classes will be priced out individually so you can take them individually but they're going to have individual prices and I've told my prior students that if you do want to take a class you want an individual price because you took a class before I will make sure that you get the discount out of this package if you want the other two if you want the whole package so you would click on this link here and I can click on it here and show you. Uh, I thought it worked earlier. Let me try this one. So you would go to our website page, and then there's a drop down box where it says contact us, and it should come up in a minute here. There we go. And you're going to scroll down and you put in your name. It's not much information that you have to put in, and then you put class enrollment package. Don't just do class enrollment, that means you want one individual class. Do class enrollment package, let us know in this box here that you just saw the Breaking Through Barriers webinar and we will send you uh, the options that you have for payment. And You can tell us on there if you need the payment break, broken down over 28 weeks because that's if you take the whole package. If you take a class out of the package, then it reduces down by that number of weeks. So it would be 12 plus 8 if you took class 1 and 2. If you just took 2 and 3, it would be 8 plus 8. So we have to make sure the class is paid for fully before you finish the class. Otherwise, we'll have people taking the class and not paying, unfortunately. And so we have to do it that way. And here's a sample from this class. Same case, but what you would pull out and use in this class is the plaintiffs have also failed to point to any law or precedent supporting the notion that now they say aliens but basically we would be using this part to say that you didn't have a law or precedent to show that it was a fundamental right and therefore you got denied and that's why you're needing these laws to change and you would still argue the statutes were unconstitutional and they weren't allowed to, vi allowed to violate but you could show where you know the laws and the precedents aren't sufficient and you would show the way they did supporting other supporting case law to go along with that and again it may not be this exact specific thing but I'm showing you how we would pull different parts out of a case and use it for the different classes this one would be to show that you're not getting protection for your fundamental rights if you're trying to get a lawmaker to pass a constitutional statute and here's one more part from this case and this is if you're I told you I'd mention this later this is if you're seeking injunctive relief and what is required to get that injunctive relief. So that would be like a mandamus. In this person's particular case, they filed a temporary restraining order. They wanted the order of the court to not be enforced so they could come back into the United States, take care of their child, and challenge on appeal. And they got denied because they had already left the country on their own but also for other reasons they didn't meet the four prongs the substantial likelihood of success on the merits is number one number two substantial threat of irreparable injury if injunctive relief is denied number three a balancing of the hardships in the plaintiff's favor and four that the public interest favors relief so you would have to make sure that your specific circumstances meet this criteria and if it does you can file for injunction against your trial court 
from enforcing the orders that they made. Okay, and again, this isn't necessarily applicable. This isn't this particular one. I'm not showing you saying it's only applicable to course three. I'm just showing you this because I mentioned it earlier in the webinar that I would tell you, you know, about the mandamus or the injunctive relief or the temporary restraining order that a lot of parents are not using. These are the two books that you get right away when you enroll in the class. We just will ask you for your first payment whichever way you're doing it or if you pay in full these books will be mailed out to you and you'll have these available so you can read through them immediately and again you need to enroll in 48 hours if you want the $1200 special the next webinar we have coming up is Tuesday and I just wanted to let you guys know and the, it's the top five reasons your family law attorney might be failing you and what you can do about it. This super, super important webinar, especially if it, any of you are planning to go to the rallies this Friday, I encourage everyone to go to support equal parental rights, to support updating statutes and bring them to constitutional compliance. We will be in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but if you are also in the middle of fighting with the results that you're getting from an attorney and you're feeling bullied and you want to know right away what you can do so you can go to that rally and know that you're empowered and know the right path to make especially if you got to make any decisions this week you want to come to this webinar we will be releasing a I don't like to call it a contract because we're not lawyers but it is essentially an agreement that you can bring directly to your attorney that outlines all the rights that we could think of constitutionally and ask your attorney to agree to that. It's very powerful. It gives you a way to make sure that you're putting that attorney on notice and you're not giving them money without telling them what you are expecting them to do. And only a clear definition of your rights is going to do this. So we will be giving that to you during this webinar. Even if you don't attend in person, it's going to get emailed to you after the webinar if you're not there. But if you at least enroll, you will get that agreement. Okay, there we are. Okay, so there's no guarantee that injunctions work, but we're saying to try them, Darren, because if you don't try them, you're guaranteed that they won't work. But remember, there's all that criteria that they have in the injunctions. We're not saying that they're easy, but we're saying it. If you've got what it what meets that criteria, use it. And if you get approved, then you're gonna you're gonna be relieved of whatever they are trying to enforce on you. I know that at the trial court level, they tried to make us do depositions, and we filed a protective order. They actually called it a quash or a protective order, and we were out of those depositions. So a lot of people don't realize they can do that and they don't do it, they don't try it, and then they end up giving the other side stuff that they can pick on, and then they spend the entire time in their hearings doing nothing but arguing against what they picked on as opposed to trying to get protected, their rights protected. And uh, Darren, what's happened to you is they immediately attack you, made allegations, and then you're constantly trying to dig out of that hole now. And st instead of just getting protection for your rights, you're trying to prove to them that you're worthy to have those rights back because they immediately took them from you. So, okay, yeah, I know you want to know more about this stuff, and if you guys do, then you might want to see if you're able to take those other courses. If not, if you don't have the book, get the books, and we will be seeing some of you guys at the workshop that we go to in Florida, and then some of you others in Sacramento. So we look forward to this, and I really appreciate some of you guys that come to every webinar. So thank you so much, and if you have additional questions, send it to me in email. Good seeing you guys again. I'm going to sign off. You're welcome. Thanks for the compliment.